So, uh, I'm going to um, do a bit of an intro to positive tipping points. Sounds like some of you are familiar with it, um, some of you uh, not. I'm not going to focus too much on the um, uh, the, the kind of the, the detail I'm going to talk about, the, the idea of where it comes from, and a particular framework for thinking about positive tipping points that then we can have a go at actually playing with in, in practice. Um, there's lots of other uh, information out there which I can send in a follow up email to everyone who signed up on Eventbrite. Um, and I'm sure we can get it out other ways as well. Um, one of the key things to say about this is this is live research. This is happening at the moment. So it's one of the kind of principles of doing events like this is to test it, get ideas, get feedback, make sure that this research doesn't just happen in a you know an, in an academic silo. Uh, and so everything that comes out here, all of the <coughs> ideas, all of the kind of the concepts. I'll be then feeding back into that wider team and, and you know, we welcome everyone else to, to, to share feedback with the, with the university as well through various other mechanisms. Um, but I want to start just briefly talking about yeah, the idea of systems. Um, so one of, the, one of the challenges I think that the positive tipping point framework can be really useful uh, at is at a local level, is thinking about when we think about change and positive change, um, whether that's climate change or anything else, a lot of our attention, very naturally as human beings, goes towards innovation. Most of the funding goes towards innovation, uh, most of the attention, the news, it's, you know, things that are new, shiny, that we can all get excited about. But really, we, we're learning more, much more and more that, that systems are, are where change really happens. That's where you get kind of deep change, change that, that lasts. And so what, we're, what I think the, the, the tipping points framework is a really helpful way to do is it, of, of not saying innovation isn't, don't bother, but locating that within the wider system. And so thinking, when we're talking about Exeter, whatever the change that we want to see in Exeter, yes, we can focus on in innovations here and there, but actually it's more, much more about how do we understand, map, and shift the system of Exeter, which is a, obviously a very complex thing to do. Um, and that complexity, um, the, uh, I've been talking and learning about systems thinking for many, many years, and the, the best way I get my head around it is the difference between a bicycle and a cyclist. Okay, so a bicycle is a complicated uh, system. So it, you can take it apart and put it back together again. It's got various kind of moving parts, it's totally predictable. You know if you kind of turn that handle or pull that lever, you know what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, innovation can be really useful for a, for a bicycle because you can kind of control the whole way of that, that, that that system operates. It's a, it's a kind of a closed system. But a cyclist is uh, an example of a, of a complex system. So this is something that's not totally predictable. As soon as you put a cyclist on a bike, you don't really know exactly what's going to happen. You might be able to predict some of it. You might know the traffic. You might know what they have for breakfast that morning. But you're not going to know exactly uh, what's going to happen to them on that journey. So while we need uh, expertise to control a complicated system, to, to really manage a complex system, we need perspective, multiple perspectives, because whatever perspective we're standing at is not going to be one that tells us the whole story. So I think this is, uh, uh, this is thinking about complex systems that is really important. And this is key for thinking about climate, obviously, and, and uh, whether that's you know, Exeter or whether that's internationally, um, because climate change is a complex problem. And if we treat it as a complicated problem by just looking at what carbon can we count, uh, and these, these challenges that we can boil down into, into countable numbers, we're going to really miss the bigger picture of what's going on. And that can lead to unintended consequences, it can lead to really not understanding what is happening within that system. So there's an element of letting go of control within systems thinking that I think is really important by accepting that we don't know and we can't understand absolutely everything. So then coming into uh, tipping points, um, I'm very enjoying this lo-fi uh, presentation <laughs> style. Such a refreshing change online. Uh, Apart from that, happens. Um, so um, thinking about tipping points. So this is an idea that talks about how change happens in systems. So moving away from kind of a linear A to B, we do something, the change happens, and then we get to B. Uh, and thinking about it from a much more systemic perspective. Uh, so this is an S curve, uh, which again, you might be familiar with. <laughs> see that um, and this is uh, roughly you could map most successful technological uh, innovations in the last you know 100 years on a map like this on a curve like this this bit might be shorter but rather than things happening in a straight line which is what we sometimes think about 
uh, when we think about change occurring, what tends to happen is that not a lot goes on and then things happen very, very quickly and then they plateau. Uh, and, and so the positive tipping points or the tipping points idea is that there's a way of thinking about well, how do we, how do we understand that? How do we recognise when these, these things might be occurring? Because within the tipping points framework, the key point is not, uh, is not here, that point where we finally get to where we want to be or where we don't want to be. And it's not even here. The key point is, is this bit here. So it's the point when, instead of facing resistance to the change that's emerging, we suddenly face momentum to the change. Uh, and it suddenly becomes a lot easier. So one of the more common ways of understanding tipping points is about negative tipping points, you know, things like glacial melt, uh, monsoon seasons shifting, uh, uh, deforestation. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk about, um, well, even if we're not at the point of disaster just yet, we're not at the point where the, the, the glacier has completely melted or the, uh, the ocean current has shifted, if we get close to this point where resistance becomes momentum, that's the dangerous point within negative tipping points, because that's the point where it's very, very hard to stop it. But obviously in terms of positive tipping points, we can kind of flip that and think about, well, change can be very, very, very hard to, uh, to create, uh, and this bit can feel very, very difficult, but if we get to the point where there's momentum behind the change we want, that's the really interesting bit. So this is where we want to focus on. Um, and I should say, obviously, positive and negative are very binary ideas, and one person's positive might be not somebody else's negative. But within climate, I think it's, there's a fairly broad agreement of what's good and what's bad. Certainly, I would hope in this room. Um, so, positive tipping points as a as a theory, as a framework. This is, uh, I think, um, some of you might be familiar with this kind of this model, this idea. So, the principle here is. We're in state A and we want to be in state B. So let's say, you know, this is us, this, this ball. Um, and rather, if we're thinking about uh, in, things in li linear terms, it's, okay, well, we get from there to there. But the tipping point idea is, so this is the key bit. Like on that previous graph, this is the bit that we want to get to. So this is the resistance, and then this is the momentum. So the key idea is, how do we get this system, this, step, this system from this state to that state, and how do we understand where on this curve we might be, so how, how we get to this point where we no longer really need to keep pushing. There's a kind of a cascading effect where the change just happens. Um, one of the, uh, you know, you th think of lots of different examples like, um, uh, you know, plastic-free cities, plastic-free towns. You know, whatever you think of, of the actual impact of a project like that, um, I think you can see that we, it feels like we've passed the tipping point of that, of that moment. Uh, and now, you know, a plastic-free community is a pretty normal idea in a way that it wasn't 15 years ago. And you might think, uh, you know, when people talk about plastic-free projects, I mean, what's the, main, what's the kind of the thing that comes to mind of what caused that or what impacted that? Plastic-free movements. David Attenborough, Blue Planet. Exactly. That's the thing. That's the kind of the moment, and that's sometimes the thing that people think of. Okay, well, that's the moment. That's the that's the point where it tipped. David Attenborough doing that program. But what we're really, really interested in is, well, okay, well, what happened here? Because if David Attenborough did that program 20 years ago, we probably wouldn't have had a, such a such an impact. So what what are the conditions that allowed that moment to have the impact that it did? And that's what this framework is really about exploring. So to give a, a kind of a community level example, we go, I might borrow your pronunciation skills here so that I don't uh, butcher this. Can you, uh, bon in bundle? <laughs> yes. So this is uh, Bonn in Transition, um, a transition group in, in, the, uh, in Bonn. Uh, and um, uh, this is an example I think is, is, is a really nice one, a really interesting one, of uh, a group that wanted to have a really systemic impact in their community. And they started out doing wildflower projects. So, you know, a fairly low key, low impact thing in terms of, this, you know, that's not going to save the world, that's not going to transform a city. But what they found was by doing wildfire projects, they, they, um, they got a lot of legitimacy with the local council, with the local government. You know, they saw them as, okay, reliable, accountable, uh, effective people. Uh, and then uh, there started to be uh, XR pressure, so separate groups, XR groups, putting pressure on the council, you have to do this, you have to do that, which as I'm sure a lot of you will have experienced, put the councils back up, they're a bit scared about that, we don't want to deal with 
those people. Okay, well, let's go to Bond in Transition, who we know, who we trust, who we've seen that, that, that relationship grow. And so they, um, they were then invited to uh, help write the climate strategy, the annual climate strategy of that city. Uh, and what's resulted as, uh, out of that is um, they now have funded roles from the, from the local government for people within the transition movement to actively, proactively help shape the climate strategy of that place. So a fairly simple example, but I think one that demonstrates a few things. Firstly, that the impact of doing the wildflower project wasn't just that there were wildflowers. It created the conditions for more possibilities to emerge. Without that, these things wouldn't have happened but there isn't really any kind of direct impact link between them. And, and, and XR pressure, um, one of the key aspects of uh, tipping points is thinking about collaboration and cooperation and how we connected to the other things within the system that we're trying to influence. So while there wasn't really much connection between Bond in Transition and the XR groups, the fact that these things were happening in the same system affected each other. So XR could still do the sort of, uh, you know, the fairly uh, intense pressurising of the local government, uh, and then Bonn in transition could kind of uh, could liaise with them, but also uh, also represent a different approach to to the local government. So again, this isn't saying that this is the right way to do it, but it's an interesting example. And then leading to a, a, a really systemic shift. I mean, having funded roles in a community is a really systemic shift in in how that community can support itself. So I think that is an example of where we can see there is a. a, a, a a tipping point has been reached, they're now in a different state, uh, and so that is an example of how do we learn from that, how do we learn from how that system changed, is a really interesting question. So, a uh, couple more things, just before we get into what does this mean in, in practice. Um, a few things about um, thinking about this in terms of Exeter. So again, we've got the, uh, we've got the tipping point here, uh, and we've got, uh, we're, in, we're in state A. We'll talk in a minute about you know, how do we get to this point. But one of the really interesting ideas about, about tipping points is this point is a sort of a early warning indicator area. So this is the point when you start to notice that change is coming. Um, and so some examples might be, um, one of the examples I've been talking about recently is around um, young people starting to refuse to work for organisations who don't have climate policies or climate values. So we clearly haven't reached a point where that is the norm and organisations have to have these things in place if they want to recruit, recruit young people, but there's a sense that there's a change coming, that there is a shift. So we can sense that maybe we're in a point where businesses are going to have to start uh, running themselves differently in order to recruit people. But one of the key things about early warning indicators is it raises the, the question that I'm drawing this on a 2D bit of paper, but if you imagine this as a 3D image and as a, as a kind of a hill, if you push a ball to the top of a hill, there are almost an infinite number of places that ball could roll down to. So yes, we could end up in B, but we could end up in C or D or E. And some of these things might not be very good, they might be pretty negative places to be. So we, we can come back to what this means in, in practice, but this idea of noticing that a change is coming, so within Exeter, how are the ways we might notice that change is emerging, and what is the kind of the dominant alternative that is out there? So when we talked about this within the context of climate justice, when you think about what are some of the, if our current system changes, what are some of the dominant alternatives? And there's a strong argument that one of the alternatives is fascism. Right? I mean, that, that's a kind of a, a, a political system that is, is kind of waiting in the wings. You, you can see it, you can see the, the, the potential for that to, to be there. So how do we, Make sure that if we push for change, we don't push for a change that is one that's co-opted by the, the, the powers that are already in place. So that's, I think, a really important part of thinking about this in, in, kind of in, in three dimensions rather than two. So, last um, very high-tech slide. Um, how do we actually work with this? So what we're going to do in a minute is I'm going to invite you to... Um, I've got three stations around the room. Uh, of the, the way we can break down this framework into, into, into kind of three stages, which is, um, firstly, we want to create the conditions for change. So these are the things that, okay, so if, if we want Exeter to be a climate positive city, and I'm not going to more define that because one of the whole points of this is 
there's not one vision we're talking about. We want positive change. There's many, many forms that that could take. But what are the conditions that are common across a lot of those different potential futures? What are the things that need to be happening within, uh, within Exeter for change to be able to emerge? So I've got some examples on the, on the, um, the one over there. So these would be things like a population size. So sometimes uh, change can happen much more easily in a smaller population because things don't have to travel so far, uh, ideas don't need uh, so much time to, to kind of percolate. It could be also about, is this new change desirable to people? So if you want people, the, the extra community to dis display more um, a climate positive behavior, is that behavior desirable? Is it accessible? Is it affordable? So all of these questions about are the conditions for that shift to that new behavior or that new technology or that new policy or whatever that change is that you want to see, are the conditions in place? And if they are, the kind of the effect of it is sort of, we're starting to lower the curve, which if you think about this again as resistance, it's reducing the amount of resistance that is in place for that change. Next, we have the reinforcement <coughs> feedback loops. So these are the things that uh, take the conditions to change and make them stronger, make them, uh, uh, yeah, get, get reinforced. So things like critical mass, once you reach a certain number of people, an idea just starts to flow much quicker, or a behavior flows much quicker. It could also be about economies of scale, like the more you do something, the cheaper it gets, or learning by doing. The more you do something, the better at it you get. So the more people practice a certain type of behavior, it could be about cooperation. So if there's lots of different groups working on roughly a, a kind of a similar vision, but they're in isolation, when they come together, it really reinforces that uh, and, and creates positive feedback for the change that they're trying to, to create. So with the reinforcing feedbacks, we have a kind of a further dampening of that, of that curve. Um, and feedback loops is, is I think there's another, another key thing about feedback loops is you can have negative feedback loops, right? I mean, these are the things that uh, reinforce the current system. So the things that stop change from happening. Uh, so, you know, think about advertising as a dampening feedback loop. You know, we're constantly getting messages that we need to buy more, we need to own more, we'll buy this thing, then we'll be happy, and then we'll buy that thing, and then we'll be happy. So we're constantly getting that, that message to stop us from changing our behavior. So it's really good to think about the negative feedback loops as well as the, the, the reinforcing ones. And then we get to the tr triggering the change. And this can be where the innovation comes in. So it could be a, uh, you know, a, a, a new invention. It could be a new behavior. It could be David Attenborough in Blue Planet. It could be a, a policy uh, change that comes in. But this is the thing that then triggers that change from happening. Um, so, and, and what we can kind of demonstrate this in this way. So what you can see, once we've, uh, once we've got the, the kind of the curve up here, if our system is here, it's now just momentum. There is no more resistance to be, uh, to be overcome. That's how this basically works in principle. So we kind of, we, we push up this, we reduce the amount of resistance and get to that point where suddenly resistance turns to momentum and we can go into the, the new system that we want to be. So that, in a nutshell, is the positive tipping points framework. I mean, I could, you know, I'm sure we could all talk about it for like the whole time we've got here, but I, I'm really keen that we kind of play around with it. So what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute is I've got conditions to change, feedback loops, and triggers on bits of uh, flip chart over there. And the question is, we've got some post-its on, the, um, on the table. There's yellow post-its and blue post-its. So the question is, what's going on within Exeter? What are you seeing that fits within those areas? And, and you can put those ones on the yellow post-it notes, and on the blue post-it notes is what is missing. So think about all of the work that you're seeing, the things that you're involved in, the things that other people are involved in, that you're aware about, and how do they map? What are they doing? How are they interacting with this model? So what conditions for change are they creating? Are they about giving people information? Are they about supporting other things that are going on, so reinforcing those ideas? Or are they pushing for triggers? Are they kind of lobbying for new policies? or trying to secure significant investment that can be that trigger that can change. Uh, this, so some of you might be familiar with this, other people that might be completely new, so don't worry if it's a bit confusing. The whole point of this is to play around with it. See how this model works. If it feels unnatural, if it doesn't quite fit, that's really useful to know as well, because this is ongoing research, this is ongoing work, uh, and, and this will inform you know, better resources, better way of communicating these ideas. Um, just 
before we do that, um, if anyone's got any kind of really burning clarification questions or something that doesn't quite make sense or something that'd be useful for me to go over, um, please do say, but I'm keen we kind of get cracking onto this because I'm sure we could discuss forever. I do have one question. Yeah. I mean, what or who or how would you define resistance? Um, resistance is basically, yeah, opposition to change. So it could be like purposeful. So it could be people who recognise that you're pushing for a particular type of change and they don't want that to happen. So if you think about the conditions for change, they might be trying to remove those things. So if, if you want to make a new behaviour more accessible, they might be getting in the way of that and making that, um, uh, making the current system cheaper all the time. You know, I mean, and that kind of, you know, how, how mm. capitalism works in a way, right? You kind of, it's constantly reinforcing itself and creating new conditions as people realise that maybe it's not actually everything they wanted it to be. Um, or they could be accidental, you know, there can be kind of natural resistance to change because as human beings, change can sometimes be quite scary and uncertain. So it can just be a kind of a natural tendency to, if we don't understand something, we're less likely to, to move forward towards it. And then the feedback loops, again, resistance can be those, those things that reinforce or, or dampen um, uh, and make it much harder to kind of reach that point where we gain momentum. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah? I mean, uh, I think when we get up to this, we can kind of look at, when we've got ideas down, we can look at things, um, more specific examples, which hopefully will answer a bit better. Yeah.